Are the Jews God's chosen people? Really? What justifies them being chosen? God has no favorites. The Bible said that everybody's somebody to God. Well, that's not true. The Jews are God's chosen people. And he has a distinct covenant and relationship with them that is irrevocable. Yes, God does love people. But this message that has become constantly regurgitated in modern theology that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life is not found in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Obviously we understand that God is a God of love. He that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. But there's an overemphasis upon love and grace in the modern message that excludes God's plan of salvation. And if you're going to preach that God loves people, you need to equally preach that God hates sin. And that sin separates us from a loving God. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says God hates the wicked every day. When's the last time you heard a sermon on that passage? Probably never. And I'm not trying to turn God into a mean-spirited deity. I'm just telling you that he's a God of holiness. And he's a God of justice. And he's a God of righteousness. And the love of God in the Bible speaks primarily, if you're going to do the weight of balance in Scripture, speaks primarily to those who have received Christ. Are the Jews God's chosen people? Well, a careful study of the Old Testament reveals how God created them. God distinctly separated them. And then God protected the bloodline of the Jews. For those who do not think that God's covenant with the Jews is everlasting and irrevocable, how do you explain that Israel is the only country in the world that still has the same name, is still located in the same land, and speaks the same language as it did 3,000 years ago when God gave this promise? And the Jewish bloodline is the only bloodline preserved throughout civilization that still has original purity. No other bloodline of any culture outside of the Jews can say that. God in his foreknowledge had a plan from the very beginning to distinguish a very small nation or race of people called the Jews. But where do we find that in the Bible? Well, there are multiple passages, but let's begin in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and take the time to open your Bible and get a highlighter ready. Some of these classic passages as I teach on Israel and the Jews and our responsibility in modern ministry to understand this message in context of eschatology is vitally important. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. The Bible said, For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on the earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations, for you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you and he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. So question number one, are the Jews God's chosen people? Make no mistake about it. This passage and multiple other passages make it clear to us that God chose the Jews and they are still his chosen people. But it brings us to the analytical question that comes out of that why you know anybody that has a mind that does analysis and synthesis and I hope if the Lord tarries and you become a parent should Jesus tarry that when you're raising children children are going to ask you why four million times before lunch 
They just constantly do. I mean, if their brain activity is functional, it's a normal part of wanting to learn. Why, Daddy? Why, Mommy? And if we're not careful in Christ Christianity, we tell our children what to believe without necessarily doing a good job of explaining why we believe. And I don't want to be guilty in my new position of standing at the sacred desk and opening up the Holy Bible and providing lectures that are all diagnosis with no remedy. My protocols in evangelism have always been, obviously, I'm speaking to unsaved people. I'm speaking to unreached people. I'm preaching to critical people. I'm preaching to agnostics and even atheists and so on. And so for 44 years, my protocols in the pulpit have always leaned towards apologetics. I want unbelieving people to have an intellectual reason to hold on to. Even though you come to Christ by faith, you don't have to throw your brain away to become a Christian. The Bible is intellectual. The Bible is historical. The Bible is authentic. The Bible is provable. And one of the greatest ways to prove the Bible to a critical, unbelieving mind is through Bible prophecy because that's what separates the Bible from all other religions in the world who have sacred books and sacred writings. The Bible is 27% prophetic in content. No other religion can say that. And not only is the Bible 27% prophetic in content, over 80% of those prophecies have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy, which gives even an unbelieving, critical, analytical mind a basis of believing if 80% has already come to pass with total accuracy, there's a good reason to believe that the remaining percentages of prophecies will also come to pass. So I've shown you in the Bible, and again, we're doing a chapel. This is not an exhaustive study. But if people in the world ask you, are the Jews God's chosen people? You now should have the ability to open your Bible and show them in the scripture and then explain to them, yes, they are God's chosen people. But probably thinking minds are going to follow that up with why. Why did God choose the Jews? If time allowed, we'd go into the third chapter of Genesis and deal with the story of original sin. I'm not dealing with an unsaved audience. I'm dealing with Christians and Bible college students. I think most of you hopefully understand the story of Adam and Eve and sin and the transgression and the separation from original fellowship and so forth, and the Bible tells us in Romans, wherefore by the sin of one man, by the way, ladies, it didn't say Eve, it held Adam responsible. Wherefore by the sin of one man, sin became a part of the human race, and then Paul went on to say in Romans 3, all have sinned, but it was man who was held responsible for original sin because God had created him originally in the divine chain of command as the head of the home. God intended for the man of the house to be the godly example who supports a godly wife to raise godly children. And we live in a culture where that has been abdicated and by and large, women get the kids up on Sunday morning, get them dressed, take them to church, and dad sits home and watches football or whatever. There needs to be a change in that for us to have spiritual awakening in this country. And all of the men that are listening to me, you must forever commit yourself to be the spiritual head of your home, not in domination, not in dictatorship, but by godly and Christ-like example, purpose that you're going to be the head of your home and you're going to protect your wife and you're going to protect your children and you're going to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord because in the original sin story, when it was all said and done, the Bible said, wherefore by the sin sin of one man. He failed to protect his wife Eve and left her in a vulnerable place. 
So God, knowing original sin from the beginning of time, knew that something had to be done to deal with the curse of sin that entered humanity through the sin of Adam and Eve. So again, Galatians, or excuse me, Genesis 3, uh, if time allowed, we'd take time to go into Ephesians 1 and 2, do your own reading outside of chapel on that, mark it down and come back to it. But the ultimate goal of God's choice of the Jews as his chosen people is very simple. God had to bring in what we call Messiah. Someone had to come and become the lamb, the sinless lamb, the spotless sacrifice. As the New Testament called Christ, the mediator between man and God. Original sin changed the original plan. And so God had to rewrite and in his understanding make allowance for man's frailty. He offered his only son. Jesus had to come logically from some nation. The Messiah had to come through some lineage had to be born through some people, and God chose Israel. God first promised the Messiah through the aftermath of Adam and Eve's sin. Later, God specified that the Messiah would come from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the fact that God has an eternal future for Israel is evident from a study of Scripture I don't know whether they'll cover it in your classes or which classes would cover it, but in my studies through the years, it's commonly referred to as the law of proportion. The more the scripture puts weight upon a doctrine or a dogma or a teaching, it's God's way. How many of you know that when God gave us the scripture, he didn't waste words? He didn't sit down one day and say, I need to write a thick book. Where will I ever come up with the content? Every word in the Bible is valuable. Every word in the Bible is holy. Every word in the Bible is sacred. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words will never pass away. Never lose your love and respect for the Bible. Yesterday in the aftermath of my inauguration service, uh, somebody, uh, in, and you know, I'm not pointing fingers, but Somebody said, I'll hold your Bible while we take some pictures. And after the pictures were done, I was looking for my Bible and it was laying on the ground. That disturbs me. Your Bible should never be on the ground. Your Bible should not be where your shoes tread. And we don't even think that way in America. Let me tell you, my travels in world missions, you would be rebuked if you took a Bible and put it on the ground by most Christian cultures outside of the West. Never lose your love for the Bible. I always buy expensive Bibles and I always buy expensive Bible cases because I want my Bible to last. I know that when my father passed from this earth, the only thing I really wanted was I wanted one of my father's Bibles that was well-worn. If Jesus tarries, one day your kids aren't going to fight over your iPhone and your MacBook and your gaming station. If you raise godly kids, they're going to want the things that have spiritual value and hopefully they'll want your Bible. May it be well-preserved and well-loved and well-protected and well-marked. The fact that God has an eternal future for Israel is evident through that law of proportion because five-sixths of the Bible, did you catch that? Five-sixths of the Bible bears directly or indirectly upon the Jews. And Jesus was Jewish. The central figure who brought Jews and Gentiles together. That's why I mentioned Ephesians chapter 2. I believe it's down around verse 14. But Israel has not only been chosen by God and loved by God and covenant with God, 
They've had responsibilities. How many of you know the scripture says, to whom much is given, much shall also be required. Israel throughout its history had the responsibilities of protecting and preserving the law. They were called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were called to bring renown and praise and honor to the Lord. So the Jews are not just chosen and randomly stamped as God's chosen. They were giving, given holy, sacred responsibilities. And to this day, even though they may not be living in the total fulfillment of it, the Jewish nation and the Jewish people have a high and holy calling. That's what the tribulation is all about. The church age, as I read, and we could take other passages, Paul makes it clear, God opened a window for the Gentiles to bring jealousy, to evoke jealousy in the Jewish people. But after the church is raptured and we enter into the tribulation, we know the exact day that the tribulation begins. Daniel 9, 27 tells us that the Antichrist, whoever that charismatic, world-dominated global leader is will be revealed by the signing of a peace treaty in Jerusalem at some high-profile location. And the eyes of the world will probably carry it instantaneously throughout the globe. But the moment whoever that political, charismatic, demonically appointed leader is, when he signs that peace treaty in Israel, Daniel 9, 27, that's the day that the tribulation begins. We know the exact day the tribulation begins by Scripture. We also know the exact day that it ends. First of all, we know by the prophecy of Daniel in the 70 sets of seven that it's seven years in length, not by our calendar, but by the Hebraic calendar of 360 days. So we know by actual math because we know when the tribulation begins we can do the math of seven times 360 from that day arrive at the exact day that it ends but we also have the exclamation point of the visible second coming of Jesus Christ that's why we know that the rapture is an event distinct from the second coming and again, talk about doctrines that are under attack in modern evangelicalism. The rapture has been under attack for the last decade or more and intensifying, sadly, by even some notable Pentecostal authors. And in my life notes, I have 50 biblical arguments for the rapture, not only the rapture, the rapture taking place before the tribulation. Now, I know I have brothers and sisters in the body of Christ that have varying opinions on the chronology of Bible prophecy. Let me just give you a solid piece of gold nugget here. Don't miss this. There must never be a wavering on essential doctrine in the body of Christ. When it comes to essential doctrine, for example, salvation through faith alone, through Christ alone, that's an essential doctrine. So there is no wavering on essential doctrines, and I don't have time to preach on all the essential doctrines. Maybe we'll do that on a later date. But there are also what are called secondary doctrines. For example, not everybody believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. So I, though I'm thoroughly Pentecostal, I do not tolerate, nor do I stand for, those in the Pentecostal realm who say that unless you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're not truly saved. Because the last time I read the Bible, the thief on the cross wasn't in the upper room. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Neither do I agree with my Pentecostal brothers who teach that unless you've been baptized in water, fully submerged in the name of the Trinity, that you're not properly saved. You're not saved through water baptism. You're not saved through the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. There will be many people in heaven who are not Pentecostal. There probably will be more people in heaven who are not Pentecostal. 
And we should always have a love and respect for the body of Christ. But listen to me when I tell you this. Not everybody agrees on the chronology of Bible prophecy. That doesn't mean that I disrespect them. That doesn't mean that I don't honor them. I will spend eternity in heaven, in the new heaven, the new earth, with people that maybe had differing points of view on the chronology of eschatology. Thank <laughs> you.